Well, welcome back to Palestine Deep Dive, and apologies to uh, those of you who tuned in on Friday, but we're back here today, delighted to be back, and with uh, viewers from across the world, um, with our special guests, Diana Butu and Gideon Levy. Uh, I mean, every week uh, we look at the main issues that are surfacing in the news. We we do a deep dive on Middle East affairs. We get try to get to the bottom of what's really happening, and we report. Uh, and we we investigate what what the rest of the uh, media tends to ignore, and we are very lucky to have uh, great guests and lucky to have you. So please, if you've got questions, do send them in. Um, we'll be coming to you as soon as we hear from you. Um, but I want to just begin uh, by saying uh, a little bit about our guest today, Diana. Uh, Diana Butu is a Palestinian Canadian lawyer. Uh, she's a former spokesperson the Palestine Liberation Organization, and she's best known for her work as a legal advisor and a participant in peace negotiations between Israel and Palestinian organizations. And she's been associated with Stanford University, with Harvard University, and of course, the Institute of Middle East Understanding. Welcome, Diana. Uh, Gideon Levy uh, is a Haaretz columnist. He's been a member of the newspaper's editorial board. And uh, Gideon joined Heretz in 1982, spent four years as the newspaper's deputy editor. He's the author of the weekly Twilight Zone feature, which covers the Israeli occupation in the West Bank and Gaza over the past 25 years. And he's been a writer of political editorials for that newspaper. He's a weekly columnist, uh, and he's a recipient of a number of awards over the years, including the Euromed Journalist uh, Prize for 2008 and the Leipzig Free Freedom Prize in 2001. His new book, The Punishment of Gaza, has just been published by Verso Publishing House in London and New York. So here are our two great guests today. And I, I just wanted to begin um, by asking you, Diana, talking of uh, what's been happening in recent uh, days, the Assassination of the Iranian nuclear scientist. Uh, it's a it's a big story. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of conjecture, a lot of uh, guessing, a lot of pointing of fingers. Um, it, it, uh, some people are suggesting that this was uh, uh, an assassination that had been uh, organised or, or directed by the Israeli government, and others are saying that perhaps there is more to this than meets the eye. Uh, these things don't just happen out by accident. Um, is this is this an attempt, Diana, really, by the Israeli government, possibly with in cahoots with the Trump administration, with the Saudis, to bind this new Biden administration into um, uh, in, in, into a policy before it even takes office? Well, there's a number of actions that so far the Trump administration has taken to bind the Biden administration, a future Biden administration, and to make the any attempts that they want to do um, irreversible. So anything that they want to do in future irreversible. And some of these steps that they have taken are things like the settlement expansion that was announced in uh, East Jerusalem. Incidentally, this is the very same settlement that when Biden was vice president, um, he came and he condemned when he first when he when he first visited uh, Jerusalem in 2010. They've also taken a number of steps to do things like um, accept Israel's annexation of the West Bank by recognizing that settlements are, um, are considered to be part of Israel. They've also done this by also saying that goods that are coming from the settlements are to be labeled as goods that are coming from Israel. And they've also gone so far as to say that uh, any criticism of Israel, and including anti-Zionism, is considered to be anti-Semitism. So these are just a, a few of the steps that have been taken just in the in, in post-election uh, that we've seen. Now, the, the assassination that was also carried out in Iran we don't really have enough information at this point in time to be able to say who precisely um, is behind it. But that being said, we can definitively know that this is yet another one of the items off of Netanyahu's wish list that have been checked off during this Trump administration. Thanks, John. I mean, Gideon, um, I mean, there's already been a degree of speculation that the Biden administration might seek to rejoin the uh, JCPOA nuclear agreement with Iran. I mean, do you think that this assassination uh, or this killing 
uh, as the media describe it, uh, is in any way linked to, to trying to, to forestall that from happening? Yes and no. I mean, you should see it in the context. This assassination was not uh, one incident at a long period. I mean, that's a tool that Israel is using for many years. First, our Palestinians, uh, between the years, uh, ever since 2000, Israel assassinated over 70 Palestinians. I'm speaking about pure assassination, and let's call it by its name, it's murders. And part of them were political leaders, only political leaders. So this tool is used by Israel for, for many years. In the same time, Israel is very, very active against the Iranian presence in Syria, which also it does in a series of the really violent uh, uh, actions. And, and uh, you, you wonder how, how long do they pull the string? Uh, how, do, how, how long will Iran stand still? Because the humiliation is quite strong. It's also not the first assassination of Iranian uh, nuclear scientists. It's the seventh, I think, or maybe more. So you see it's a sequence of events. Right now, it serves also the political uh, purpose, obviously, of trying to sabotage any, any attempt of uh, Biden to get back to the, to the negotiation table and to the agreement. But it would have happened also without it. Yes, it's interesting that because um, when President Obama was elected, I think almost within within hours, he was on the phone to um, the authorities in Tehran. Um, I mean, you you do get the impression that uh, uh, also that there are there are other things at work here too. We, we we've been reading um, about the the discussions that President Trump was having about a possible um, attack on uh, Iran. Um, uh, he was apparently, we're told, uh, dissuaded from doing it. Uh, so is this all part and parcel of uh, a much broader um, uh, attempt to absolutely tie the Biden administration, tie Biden down right from the start to stop him from making that call that Obama made, do you think, Gideon? It seems so. But as I said before, it's not the only purpose because those things happened also before Biden and might also continue after Biden. It depends how decisive will he be and how ready will he be to get into a confrontation with Netanyahu. Uh, the experience tells us that when it comes to those issues and others, by the end of the day, Israel feels quite free to do whatever it wants. Mm. And, and Diana, you know, coming, coming back to you, uh, Looking at the shape of the Biden administration, I mean, look, we was beginning this discussion by talking about what has been happening in the United States. It's not the absolutely most important thing if you happen to be Palestinian living in the West West Bank or Israel or Gaza. But I mean, the, the, the what is happening uh, in Washington is significant because it, it is likely to lead to some changes. So I'm, I'm wondering, when you look at the makeup of the Biden administration, that which we know, I mean, the new Secretary of State uh, Anthony Blinken, for instance, uh, the, the appointment by um, Biden of a new US-UN ambassador um, to the United Nations, uh, who's we think is going to be a cabinet uh, appointment once again. I mean, it is as kind of, at the very least, a reversion to what is more normal in Washington. Um, but how do you how do you look at it? I mean, are you are you quite hopeful by what you see in terms of the appointments, what, how this new administration is stacking up? Um, no, to put it mildly. Um, when you look at who the people are who he's so far appointed, and we don't know all the names, the, the things that are standing out as being troublesome are um, individuals who supported the, the attack on Iran, uh, Biden himself was somebody who supported the, the attack on Iraq. And, uh, and his new um, uh, suggested Secretary of State was also somebody who has taken these very right-wing positions. So to, to put it um, simply, this is the right wing of the Democratic Party. This isn't the, this isn't the more progressive branch of it. And given that it's the right wing of the Democrat Party, 
this is the their their viewpoint is very much um, in relation to war and uh, not only in relation to war, but not necessarily in relation to doing anything positive when it comes to Palestine. Mm -hmm. I've said this before, which is to say that um, the the Biden administration, if they do anything on this issue, and it's a big if whether they're going to do anything, at most what they're going to do is to scale back and to, and to address some of the quote unquote humanitarian issues that are at play here, things like resuming funding to UNRWA, things like making sure the Palestinian Authority is now a new contact, contact uh, reopening the embassy, resuming funding to the Palestinian Authority. But I don't think that they're going to take on um, Israel in any way. I don't think that they're going to press for Israel to stop any of the settlement activity. We've already seen that within uh, the, since the election, as I mentioned earlier, with the announcement of the new settlement activity that's happening, that the Biden administration has said nothing. And they've done what other uh, administrations have done in the past, which is to hide behind the, the mantra of there's only one president at a time. And yet we see when it comes to other issues that they don't take that belief of there's only one president at a time. If I could just come in, I mean, do you think this might be an opportunity for the Palestinian leadership actually to step up, be welcoming to the Biden administration, say we, we're, we're heartened by what's happened, we appreciate that you, uh, you know, you changed, you changed your mind about military intervention when it came to Libya, we're hoping for better things from you, and here is our checklist, we'd like to work with you. Um, so actually go to, go to them on a positive note, but actually present them with a, with a, series, of a series of challenges, which they really have to begin to answer straight away. Well, so this has been the best strategy for quite some time. His strategy has always been be the good guy. Uh, do whatever is told of you, whatever is asked of you, and then present your checklist. The problem is, is that it's never our time for, for the checklist. Nobody ever comes around and says, yes, now is the time that we're actually going to stop the settlement activity. And now we're going to put the halt on the siege of Gaza. It just doesn't happen. Instead, what I think that this that the authority should be doing is taking a very serious look at this process of negotiations themselves itself and asking whether this is the uh, correct approach and instead um, doing what is correct, which is the U.S. has proven that it's not an honest broker. It's proven that it's not going to do anything when it comes to Palestine. It's proven that it's not going to liberate us in any way, shape, or form. And so we have to be pushing and we have to be demanding our own things in our own right, rather than waiting for the United States to somehow liberate us. Um, Gideon, if I can come to you, because we're beginning to get uh, people sending in their questions. People, pl please do send in your questions out there. We, we've got a question here from uh, Wally Yazbak. Wally says, uh, it looks like tomorrow that the union between Gantz and Bibi Netanyahu may fall apart. Do you think that this is possible? And when the next round of elections will take place, uh, so Bibi keeps avoiding going to jail? Does that, does that make sense to you? I hope we'll find ourselves more interesting uh, subjects rather than Israel domestic politics, <laughs> which repeats itself. You know, for many years, they, they always say that uh, football is a game that you play 90 minutes and finally Germany is, uh, is uh, winning. Uh, Israel's politics in the last 30 years and in the coming years is that uh, we are going from election to election and Netanyahu is winning. The problem is that the so-called Zionist left has totally lost its way. Uh, they have nothing to offer except of hypocrisy. In my eyes, they are many times much worse than the right-wingers because of their hypocrisy. And Netanyahu is quite free to do whatever, whatever he wants. Uh, I'm not sure that tomorrow it will decide it because tomorrow it's a preliminary uh, a, a vote, but in 2021, we will go to elections the fourth time. In 2021, Netanyahu will be re-elected, I'm afraid. Well, there's an answer to your question, Wally. Maybe not quite the answer you were expecting, but uh, there's another question. This is also for Gideon. This is from John Whitbeck in Paris. Do you think that the Israelis would finally become seriously interested in actually achieving a two-state solution if Palestinians shifted their proclaimed goal to a single, fully democratic, secular state with equal rights for all? First of all, uh, 
I lost hope in the two-state solution. It's not only that it is dead, I have my suspicion that it was never born. Because ever since the beginning of the occupation back in 67, I don't know one Israeli statesman, one Israeli prime minister who genuinely and really was ready to enable a viable Palestinian state, an independent Palestinian state, a sovereign Palestinian state. They had all kinds of ideas for those of them, even some of them even got the Nobel Prize, Peace Nobel Prize for this. It was only to make the occupation lasting longer and in many ways also more convenient for the Palestinians and also for Israel. But none of them really thought that the end of the occupation is the only solution. So the two-state solution, uh, in my view, is off the table because with 700,000 settlers who are the strongest political pressure group in Israel, there is no Israeli prime minister who, who, who would evacuate them. And without their evacuation, there is no viable Palestinian state. There might be another Bentustans, but not a viable Palestinian state. But I want to, to tell our viewer that if the expectation is that the Israelis will wake up one shining morning and say, oh, the occupation is not so nice, let's put an end to it. This didn't happen for 53 years, and it will not happen in the coming 53 years and not in the coming 530 years. It will not come from here as long as here Israel doesn't pay and is not punished for the occupation. As long as Tel Aviv, the state of Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv as a concept, does not feel the occupation, Tel Aviv will not bother about the occupation, will not do anything to put an end to it. Will it be the two-state solution, one-state solution? Why to bother? You know, it's off the table here. You see election after election. It's not even in the campaign, the, the Palestinian problem. Nobody mentions it, except of the joint list. Nobody mentions it. It's, it's just a kind of a, you know, a mosquito that we hear from time to time in our ears, not very pleasant to listen to, but nothing more than this. And therefore, it can't come from here. It will not come from here. May it be two-state solution, which I don't believe will happen anymore, or a one-state solution. One thing must be said. Those who continue to sing yesterday's song and speak about the two-state solution, knowing that it's not a possibility anymore, are playing into the hands of Israel. And this is the EU and the PA and the United Nations and obviously the United States. They all keep on speaking about the two-state solution while Israel is building more settlements and making anything impossible for the future. So. It's really time to change the discourse. It's really time to realize that the settlers won, that there will no, not be any two states, and let's draw the conclusion, the consequences of it, and try a new way, a new vision, because otherwise we'll be stuck forever and Palestine will become into a Tibet. If I might go to Diana and, to, uh, and then come back to you, Gideon, in terms of this new vision, what could it be? You've, you've been spokesperson for the PLO. You've no doubt been there in negotiations with the Israelis. Good faith. You've talked about the two-state solution. That's the agreed international position. Do you, do you agree with Gideon on this? And what could, that, what could the beginning of that new solution be? Um, absolutely. Look, the, the two-state two solution not only died a long time ago. Again, I, I agree that I don't even think it was ever really born. And, uh, and, and in fact, if you look back in history from the time that settlement construction began and Israel was never uh, stopped for that settlement construction, we can say that the two-state solution was, was dead. The problem has been that um, there's been so much pressure that's brought to bear on the Palestinian Authority over the years to simply accept <clears throat> and keep pushing for the two-state solution that um, I'm pretty sure that they don't even believe in it any longer. 
But I agree that the big problem is that the more that we speak about it, the more that we create this illusion that somehow it is attainable, when in fact it's no longer attainable. And instead, we should be pushing for an anti-apartheid struggle. We should be pushing and demanding that Israel be held to account for all of its international law violations. But what happens instead is going down the path of speaking about negotiations or two-state solution somehow makes everything disappear. So you can um, ignore settlement construction because there's going to be a, a two-state solution. You can ignore the construction of the wall because there's going to be a two-state solution. You can ignore all of the measures that Israel is doing because there's going to be this fictitious two-state solution. Instead of ignoring all those things, we should be focusing on those things and, and making sure that Israel is held to account. Otherwise, without making Israel pay, we are indeed going to continue to see this mm -hmm. fiction uh, continue to, to proliferate as though there's just this, we, do, we all wish that there was a two-state solution, but somehow something is preventing it from happening. Well, you know, both, both you and Gideon are on the same page on this. Uh, and, it, you, you know, it then comes to, I suppose, the centrality of what we're going to be speaking about today, which is Palestinian leadership uh, in these times. Um, and so the question to you, Deanna, is, I guess, you're talking about uh, effectively an anti-apartheid campaign, yeah. holding Israel responsible for breaking international law, which is repeatedly done. Um, this requires a different kind of Palestinian leadership, though, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. It absolutely does. And the problem is, is that this uh, this leadership that it requires is is not the leadership that we that we have. Um, the leadership that we have right now is very much focused on negotiations. In fact, we used to joke that the only alternative that they had to negotiations was more negotiations. And uh, although it's a joke, it, it actually is quite painful. Um, and uh, and at the same time, this is the same leadership that while saying that they want to see elections has blocked every attempt to actually have elections. And in fact, with the most recent uh, US election, we were hoping that there were going to be Palestinian elections as well. But soon enough, we've, we've now seen that that has, that that has also come to an end. And so we are saddled with a leadership that is still 27 years behind. Why 27 years? Because that was when Oslo was first signed. And, uh, and they will continue to remain 27 years behind, even though there are very there are a number of talented people who live here, who live uh, who live elsewhere, who can certainly guide and lead and uh, push uh, Israel and guide the Palestinian people to a much better, much more secure freedom. Gideon, the um, boycott, divest, sanctions movement. I mean, some people have uh, have said it's yeah, it's a, it's a great campaign, but it hasn't been particularly effective. Um, uh, and yet this is the kind of sort of campaigning type vehicle that you would imagine would be coming out of a different approach. Now, of course, Secretary of State Pompeo has just been uh, on a visit to Israel and the occupied territories and pronounced it um, to be anti-Semitic. But there's a question here that leads on from that. Uh, this is from um, Heather Fermaini. And she says, well, you know, Diana's just mentioned the anti-apartheid uh, movement. Many of us have been in part of the years, years and years campaigning uh, in relation to apartheid in South Africa. Uh, do we take their path, uh, those uh, of us who are on, on the outside? So, you know, Heather is asking, you know, is, is there an international campaign? Uh, is, is it going to be very similar to the anti-apartheid campaign in South Africa? Or does it have to be different? First of all, I want to point out that Israel changed its strategy in recent years, and uh, we should be very aware to it and to know how to react to it. Because what happens in the last years is an unbelievable process in which Israel, with the Jewish establishment in Europe and also in the United States, succeeded to criminalize any effort of putting sanctions on Israel. And they did so by using, in a very shrewd and sophisticated way, the guilt feelings of Europe and labeling any criticism of Israel as anti Semitic. This didn't start with Pompeo, it started much before Pompeo, and it is a hell of success. Europe is paralyzed. The European and the American media can 
publish now much less criticism than ever before about Israel, criticizing Israel or criticizing the occupation even without sanctions, is becoming not only unaccepted, but almost criminal. This is really unheard of. I mean, and this is really stands to the, to the entrance of the European and American societies because it touches the core issue of democracy, the core issue of freedom of speech, the core issue of having the right to put sanctions on something that you find immoral or illegal or unaccepted or criminal. And the fact that the world is cooperating with it is a very worrying phenomena, which I cannot understand it. People tell me in Europe, no, no, we can't now write this, we can't say this, because we will be accused as anti-Semites. Let them accuse you as anti-Semites. Not Israel will decide who is an anti-Semite and who not. Now, well, in, in, a, in a British situation, we have a situation with the British Labour Party and the uh, former Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, yeah. who's currently been, well, he was suspended, reinstated, and then has had the whip removed. But a deputy leader of the Labour Party telling a meeting of Labour Friends of Israel uh, and the Jewish Labour Movement that, uh, if necessary, she would expel thousands and thousands of people. Um, and it was not very clear from that whether this is these are thousands and thousands of people in the Labour Party who... Uh, are guilty of anti-Semitism or people who are guilty of supporting Jeremy Corbyn. It is a pretty astonishing situation, as you say. But then I suppose, Gideon, and I'll come back to you on this, uh, to, to you, Diana, as well. Very possibly, uh, some people might argue, um, all of this has been allowed to happen. It's a very powerful uh, movement to paint critics of Israel into this corner. Um, by the way, I'm not dismissing, or people don't dismiss the idea that there, there is anti-Semitism out there, because there is. Uh, and it's seriously bad, uh, but but painting critics as, who are critics of Israel as being anti-Semitic is something uh, that perhaps uh, would would not be so successful if there was a more dynamic Palestinian uh, and Arab response uh, and an international response similar to that as you've just been talking about, um, Gideon, to the anti-apartheid movement. So. Do you think that, the, that this does fall back to the Palestine leadership to actually make its case a lot better, as, as well as the Israelis can do, at least? This is, Mark, really, to accuse the Palestinians, they really tried everything. I mean, they tried diplomacy, and they tried armed struggle, and they tried the uh, international law. They tried almost everything. Not that I'm a great fan of the current uh, leadership. By all means, it's time to change the leadership. It's not me to, to, to decide it, but it's really, I mean, they, they, they are, it's, it's a failure. It's, it's a project which failed, and we have to realize it. But to put the blame on them, while Israel is really manipulating Europe so easily, and the United States, and putting them into the corner, look, it gives Israel immunity, which it never had before, and might last forever. Because we have to say here the truth in a very clear way. Neither the Holocaust, which was terrible and horrible, and you know we don't have to elaborate on this, nor anti-Semitism, which is terrible and horrible and, we, and still exists, and we have to fight it. Both phenomena don't give immunity to Israel to commit all its crimes on a daily basis. And this must be very clear, and people of conscience should be courageous enough to say, yes, there is anti-Semitism, but criticizing Israel in this time is not only a right, it's a duty for anyone who stands for conscience, for international law, or for justice, and not to let them manipulate us, you, as they do, not to shut up, by all means, no. Diana, to you, I mean, that wasn't so much intended as a, the question as a criticism of the Palestinian leadership, but more as a challenge. How does the Palestine leadership, how do the Palestinian people, how do Palestinian supporters, a lot of the questions coming in are on similar, are in similar vein. How do they present a case as effectively as the Israeli government has managed to do in recent years? I'm speaking truth to power. 
and uh, and they have presented a very good case. The problem is, is from for me, from my standpoint, is that you've got a disconnect. On the one hand, you have Palestine activists who are around the world and who've been doing a fantastic job of pushing the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement, and it actually has taken off. Um, when you see the amount of resources that Israel has devoted to the BDS movement, and when you see the amount of energy that Israel has devoted to the BDS movement, and when you see that there are there have been some um, some wins in a very short period of time, you see that the cause is just. The big problem is that you contrast that with the current Palestinian leadership. And unlike in the situation of, the, of South Africa, where you had vertical integration between ANC and activists on the ground, here we don't have that at all. We've got um, Palestine activists on the one hand pushing for BDS, and then a Palestinian leadership on the other hand that's actually pushing for normalization. And the two things just simply do not connect and they simply do not meet. Now, if you were to ask the Europeans, which model do they prefer? Of course, they're gonna go down the path of the normalization one. It doesn't demand anything from them. It doesn't require that they do anything. And it makes it seem that they're quote, pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel at the same time, which you can't be. And this is why um, immediately when the normalization agreements were announced, that there was a wave of people, including me and others, who've been saying that it's time for the Palestinian Authority to really rethink its strategy and to not pretend um, to have business as usual because the normalization that the Palestinian Authority has with Israel is precisely what has led to the normalization that other countries around the world have with Israel. It's only when the leadership takes the position that Israel is not normal because it's not that we will then be able to push and advocate for uh, for a united front to to confront Israel. Um, Diana, Robert in London asks, uh, and it follows on from your answer really, should Palestinians in the diaspora be looking to institutionalize their voice locally and form representative bodies to lead the case against uh, Zionism? Uh, uh, or should they wait for the PLO to become more effective and lead on this? So should effectively, should Palestinians in the diaspora take their own initiatives or should they wait for instructions, I suppose? No, take, they're, they're, it's, it's, you have to do your own leading. Um, you know, we've been waiting now for the PLO to reform itself since the, since the mid nineties and it's not gonna happen. Um, there isn't even talk of it happening. The only people who are speaking of reforming the, the PLO are people who have never even really been part of the system. And, uh, and so I think that there has to be um, much more local initiatives. And by the way, it's those local initiatives that end up becoming much more effective than anything that is um, PLO led. Um, that being said, it's, it's hard for me as somebody who was raised and, and lived in, uh, in the midst of, of having a much broader uh, leadership where there were directions that were being given from a unified leadership um, to say this. But unfortunately, this is the reality that we are now living in. This, is, this current leadership views itself and its survival as, as supreme and it's not looking toward actually instituting policies or strategies that are meant to liberate us. Thank you, Diana. I'm going back. We've got another question from uh, it's a follow-up question from uh, John Whitbeck. If I can, uh, if I can find it here. Um, yes, uh, John, and, and I'll come to you, Gideon, if I may. Since a decent two-state solution is inconceivable, shouldn't the Palestinians then shift their proclaimed goal to a peaceful anti-apartheid struggle for a single fully democratic state with equal rights for all? Wouldn't the international community outside the US have difficulty opposing democracy? Uh, well, outside the US, I'm sure there are lots of people inside the US, by the way, who are totally uh, in favor of democracy. We've just witnessed that in the presidential elections. But I think I know what John is saying. But what do you think of what do you think of his point there? That's the name of the game. I mean, I think that the only hope, and it's a very questioned hope and far away to achieve, but we have to start in a certain stage, namely to change the discourse. And we, both Diana and I mentioned it already, to start to speak, to, to focus on one thing, equal rights. 
And this cannot be reacted or answered or met by Israel with the usual answers about security, Holocaust, or whatever. If the world will be much clearer about this, Israel will have to say yes or no. The day that an American president will call the Israeli prime minister and ask him equal rights, yes or no, if the Israeli prime minister will say no, which you will, that's the end of the bluff that Israel is a democracy, because still too many people in the world see Israel as part of the West, part of the liberal world, sharing the same values, the same international universal values with the free world. What is it? And the Israel, there are three regimes. One of them is one of the most brutal tyrannies on earth. And we call it democracy. And this brutal tyranny is not a temporary phenomenon. And this bluff must be also called. Forget about it that the occupation is temporary. After 53 yeah. years, you can't call it temporary yeah. anymore. If I could be devil's advocate, uh, you know, Israel you, the, has general elections. You can go in and you can vote for different political parties, often lots of different ones. Uh, many of them, of course, take a very similar view towards the occupation. But having said that, it is a parliamentary democracy. And of course, uh, uh, those Palestinians who are within uh, Israel proper also have the right to, to vote and have representation in the, in the Knesset. So, you know, you can have a policy uh, and you can be very critical of that policy uh, in the occupied territories, but criticizing Israel for not being a democracy, that's a, that's a harder one to argue. I mean, do you want to come back on that? Yes, absolutely, because that's the bluff. That's maybe maybe the biggest bluff. Mark, you know better than I that you can't be half pregnant. Either you are pregnant or you are not pregnant. There is no third way. And how can you call a state a democracy if under its rule there are millions of people who live in, really, I'm not exaggerating, one of the most brutal tyrannies on earth today, one of the most totalitarian, violent, brutal regimes. How? What's the connection between this and democracy? You may say it's a military occupation, it's temporary. Once there will be a settlement, it will end. And then we, the Israelis, mainly the Israeli Jews, will continue to enjoy the, the benefits of liberal democracy. But it's not temporary. It's part of Israel. Israel is defined by the occupation. Israel is defined by the regime there, not by, the, by, by my freedom. The Palestinians who live half an hour away from my home, they define the regime of Israel. The fact that if I travel now half away from my home and I see two villages, one where Jews are living, settlers who benefit all the, the, the privileges and all the rights, and the village next by, a Palestinian village who doesn't get the resources and don't have any rights whatsoever, the only people in the world without citizenship. They don't belong to any state in the world, most of them. So to call all this a democracy only because Tel Aviv has freedom of speech and we liberal Jews gain all the benefits out of it is really is misleading. I'm sorry. Thanks, Gideon. I mean, Diana, lo looking at the demographics, of course, um, you know, it has been argued uh, and I guess Gideon would subscribe to this view as well that you know Israel is a is a settler state that it has to re reach an accommodation um, with the people uh, that, that that are either under occupation or living within its uh, settled border, um, a bit like the French in Algeria, a bit like the Portuguese in Angola, uh, and the demographics continue to move in in favour of the Palestinians when you look at the historic Palestine area, so. How, how might it be possible in the longer run to persuade most decent Israelis that, you know, in order to reach some proper, proper settlement, um, to avoid conflict, there has to be an acceptance that the settler state, uh, a colonial kind of settler state, is just not a viable option? 
it, look, Israel is a settler colonial state, and I want to just pick up on the issue of it being a democracy. It's not a democracy, and it's not just in relation to what's going on in the West Bank. It's also not a democracy when it comes to the Palestinians who are citizens of the state of Israel. Yes, we I'm, I am one. Yes, we have the right to vote. Um, but the state itself defines itself as a Jewish state. And ruling after ruling that the court has come out with has said that when faced with the question of is Israel a democracy versus is Israel a Jewish state, it, the court, the court itself has said that is a, it is a Jewish state. And so the issue of being a Jewish state trumps or takes precedence over anything in relation to being a democracy. So getting to the question of uh, how do you convince a settler colonial state, um, that's not my job. And they won't be convinced by it. This, what I think is going to, what I think must happen is this is why so many of us have been pushing and calling for accountability. And the reason that we are calling for accountability and for Israel to be held responsible is that on, on their own, just like other settler colonial states, they don't magically wake up and say, oh, we've, we've, done the, we've done wrong by the Palestinians. It's time for us to reverse our course of action. It's only when there is systemic pressure that's brought to bear on the state that, and on its citizens that they begin to realize um, that, there's, that there has to be a different course of action. And this is where um, my irritation is when it comes to the Palestinian leadership, that they have not adopted the BDS movement as a strategy. The BDS is not a goal in and of itself. It's simply a tool. It's simply a strategy. And the fact that they haven't adopted it uh, indicates to me that all they simply want to continue to do is to somehow convince the Israelis to be kinder, to be gentler. But that is simply not going to happen on its own accord. Today, Mark, by the way, you know, Gideon is talking about living in, in Tel Aviv. Gideon is one of the few Israelis who actually comes over and sees what life is like uh, in the occupied territories. The vast majority of Israelis have no idea what life is like for Palestinians who are living under their thumb. So much so that when you talk about the Knesset and the representation that's in the Knesset, um, of the 120 members of the Knesset, over 100 of them either want to see Palestinians living perpetually under their thumb or don't care one way or the other. The only people who continue to talk about the occupation and the evils of the occupation are the members of the joint list, the, the Knesset members from the joint list. Other than that, the occupation doesn't even seep into the minds of Israelis on a day-to-day -day basis, nor does, the, nor does their settler colonial uh, roots seep into, into the minds of Israelis on a day-to-day -day basis. It just doesn't exist. Uh, we've got a question here from Dave Chappell. Um, the webinar discussion started by referring to a, a possible assassination of the Iranian scientist by Israel. Um, Gideon also said that Israel has murdered 70 Palestinian leaders over the past 10 years. Does Diana and Gideon believe, do Gideon and Diana believe, that any effective Palestinian leaders, perhaps anywhere else in the world, risk a similar fate? And is Israel's assassination program, if it has one, known as such by those governments uh, who stay silent? Do other governments know? And do other governments actually tacitly support or just turn the other cheek, uh, turn the other way when these assassinations take place, Diana? Yes, they know that they take place. You know, Abu Jihad, Abu yeah, these were these were Palestinian leaders, others as well. The attempted assassination of Marwan Barhouti. Uh, these the, Israel does it and does it without uh, without with by literally getting away with murder, and uh, and this has been the the problem is that once again here's a, yet another policy in which Israel is given carte blanche to do whatever it wants to do. And, uh, and nobody is standing up to Israel and saying that, that these things are illegal. We saw this, by the way, I, I, there's a whole list of Palestinians who I'm now, who I haven't um, listed off in the assassination policy. I just listed a few of them. But, um, but yes, this, is, uh, this has been a longstanding policy um, that Israel's had and, and will continue to have. And, and it, doesn't even, it, doesn't even link, it doesn't even lead to any country um, any of the major countries, Europe or in the United States or Canada, uh, even condemning it in the slightest. Um, Gideon, this is a question from Alex Bustos. Uh, Alex uh, asks, 
What role do you think the Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, the Gulf, etc., can play in the struggle today uh, and following their abandonment after Oslo uh, and the millions of them who have been forgotten by the rest of the world? What, what role can the diaspora play in those countries, do you think? Just to try to get the attention of the world. It's not only in the places you mentioned. What about the refugees in Gaza? I mean, even the siege over Gaza is totally forgotten. When Gaza does not launch rockets toward Israel, Gaza is forgotten. We have a very good excuse. They are Hamas, so we can forget two million people who are living in inhuman conditions for 13 years now, almost 14 years now. What can they do just to try to appeal to the world with their cause, with their just cause? This trying, but it's quite a mission impossible because Israel took over, because Israel immediately labels even those who want to, to focus the attention at Gaza as anti-Semites. Don't you dare to mention Gaza as a ghetto. Don't you dare to tell the world the story of the siege over Gaza, which is illegal, and above all, such an injustice to people who are third and fourth generation as, as refugees who live in this poverty, and we all know Gaza, and the world couldn't care less. Well, it, you know, um, Gideon, I'll come to you, Diane. I mean, it, 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 the, after um, uh, military standoffs and the destruction of Gaza, traditionally the world steps in, it's rebuilt, it's knocked down again. This open prison camp uh, is kind of been kept on uh, life support, if you like, and partly through the UN agencies, which have recently had these great big cutbacks from the Trump administration and what have you. But there was a report out from one of the uh, UN organizations, UNCTAD, this week, and I quote, it says that um, uh, the Israeli-led blockade of the Gaza Strip has cost the Palestinian enclave more than $16 billion and pushed more than one people, one million people below the poverty line in just more than 10 years. Um, I mean, this is a, it's a shocking statistic. It's life at the, at the very edge. Does it really, Diana, take this and the inevitable, you can't keep, you can't keep the cameras out, you can't keep social media out, you can't control journalism now. Will it really take pictures of starving people in Gaza to concentrate the minds of world leaders again, do you think? I think we're already past that point, Mark. Um, I want to be clear in saying that we, that in 2014, when Israel bombed Gaza for uh, for two two months, a lot of the buildings that were supposed to be rebuilt were not rebuilt. And the reason that they were not rebuilt was because the international community kept going back and forth and humming and hawing over whether the materials were going to be dual usage materials, whether there was going to be an effective partner in Gaza because they wanted to, to bypass Hamas. And so here we are in the year 2020, a year that the, that the UN said Gaza would be unlivable, and it is unlivable. It's got a healthcare system with uh, 14,000 people who have tested positive for COVID that is on the verge of collapse. Now, 14,000 people in other places around the world doesn't, doesn't crash a healthcare system. But when you have a healthcare system that has already been on the verge of collapse because of more than a decade of blockade, 15 years of a blockade, I lived in Gaza during the blockade. I can tell you the things that were missing the, during the early years of the blockade when it was even easier to still bring things in. Things like um, bread, flour, um, milk, these things were, were yogurt, um, were, were rampantly missing. They were all, all the time, we, we had chronic shortages. And, um, and, uh, and so here we are in this year 2020, where uh, Gaza has not been rebuilt. The healthcare system is on the verge of collapse. Add to that all of the, uh, the impact of COVID. And when you talk about cameras um, getting it, you can't prevent the cameras from getting in there. In fact, the Israelis have. It is now impossible 
for uh, Israeli journalists to go down to the Gaza Strip. They're not allowed into, into the Gaza Strip at all. And for foreign journalists, it is, uh, it is an arduous uh, task to be able to, to get into Gaza. And with the pandemic, they have not been allowed to, to get in there. So what we rely on now is some forms of social media, some accounts by UN officials, but by and large, the Gaza Strip is not livable. And given that it's not livable, one would have expected that there would have been a much stronger international response against Israel and against the blockade, against the siege. But instead, we just simply don't see it because as Gideon said, those people over there are Hamas and it's easy to demonize them. I think it's only when we get past Israel's talking points and start recognizing that the people who live in Gaza are actually people. They're not demons. And when we start to say that because they are people, they're entitled to the same rights and the same freedoms and the same health care and the same privileges as other people around the world. Unless we go down that path and stop demonizing them, we're going to see a very ugly um, and even worsening situation in the Gaza Strip. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing you say that because, of course, you probably recall that the former British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, who uh, was a Middle East peace envoy, uh, uh, remarkably, in a way, given uh, uh, his record in government when it came to Iraq and what have you. But he has struck, he's argued that essentially uh, Palestinians uh, need to elect a new leadership. There needs to be new leadership. Um, and presumably what he's saying is if Palestinians in Gaza didn't elect Hamas, then it would all be changed. But do you think even if the Palestinians were to elect the most meek and mild possible administration imaginable in Gaza, it would make it the sort of change that Tony Blair says it might, and people might start being, might taking a different attitude. What do you think? Well, I'm, I'm delighted that Tony Blair, a failed politician, is the person who's offering up advice to Palestinians. Um, you know, look, I'm, I am very critical of the, Palest the current Palestinian leadership. At the same time, it's not for Tony Blair to be electing our leaders. It's for us to be electing our own leaders. And the problem is we had an election where it was free, it was fair, and they just simply didn't like the outcome. It's the equivalent of what's happening in the United States now with Trump. The elections were free, they were fair, he doesn't like the outcome, and so now he's disputing it. And, uh, and so you know, we have this system in which we have elected our leaders, and because they didn't like the outcome, and because they continued to put blockades on them, this is one of the main reasons that we haven't seen any new elections happen in the Palestinian arena. The fear is that if we do have elections um, the, and Hamas gets elected once again, and they just might, that again, the international community isn't going to recognize them. And if they don't get, if they don't get elected, if we have elections and they don't get elected and uh, we have somebody else come in, that people are gonna say that the elections are not free, not fair, or even worse, the only one of the reasons that we haven't had elections as well is because it's gotten to the point where, um, where there are, condi there are conditions that are being placed on being able to even run for elections. I just wish that the world would stop looking for reasons to deny us our freedom and look for the reasons to be, to be placing um, sanctions on Israel. It's gotta be the other way around. They've gotta be looking for us to be giving us our freedom rather than for reasons to continue to deny us our freedom. And Tony Blair was one of the worst offenders when it came to this, because as the person who was in charge of the quartet, he had an incredible amount of power. And I, I worked, I was in the, uh, the, the Palestinian Authority at that time. He had the ability to put pressure on the Israelis, but instead, he decided to retreat, as he often has in the past, and instead take Israel's word and let Israel do whatever it wanted to do. Well, Gideon, you may have seen that Tony Blair actually surfaced at the um, White House Rose Garden after the um, the, the Trump the Trump uh, administration's um, brokering of the UAE uh, peace deal with Israel. Um, that, that Tony Blair has had some. Uh, role in all of that. There was a bit of an argument about whether Tony Blair should have actually been there without uh, being in quarantine because of the COVID-19 restrictions, but we'll, we won't dwell on that. But um, And rather than just make this about Tony Blair, the, the fact is that, uh, as both you and Diana have been saying, uh, all of this is happening, continuing, and yet, um, where is the international reaction? Well, if there is any international reaction, it appears that some of the Gulf states, at least, are actually prepared to uh, do uh, have so-called deals with uh, Israel. 
Um, I say so-called, I don't mean to be dismissive, uh, but, th but these are not really peace deals because these countries have not been at war with Israel. So they're kind of a normalization of relations. Um, what do you make of all of that? First of all, the, the West, which is still the most uh, powerful and influential actor in the Middle East, the West decided many years ago that with Israel we go only in niceties. We will convince them somehow. American presidents, the leaders of Europe, it's always, let us give them some carrots and promise them and let's talk with them in a nice way. We will persuade them to an ease the occupation. We will persuade them to, to follow the international law, to follow the international resolutions. Okay, this didn't work. For 53 years, it didn't work. The world never tried an alternative road, never. I mean, Israel never was facing sanctions, so any kind, any kind of accountability, nothing, zero. Crime after crime, war after war, settlement after settlement, and only hollow condemnations. And Israel learned to ignore them, and rightly so. Why should, why should Israel bother about hollow condemnations to have no influence and no consequences? So this uh, behavior, has two sides. You have Israel on one side, you have the international community, which I think not only has a, some kind of role as, as, as an international community, but has also some kind of moral, deep responsibility toward the Palestinian people. Let's remember, and we have to say it, as much as Israel is using the justified guilt feelings of the West and of Europe in particular about the Holocaust, the Palestinians were also victims in an indirect way, victims of the Holocaust. If there is no Holocaust, there is no state of Israel. If there is no state of Israel, the Palestinians have their land. So there is also some kind, I don't want to compare the moral um, uh, uh, guilt feelings and the moral responsibility toward Israel. It's one thing, but Europe carries also a moral indirect responsibility toward the fate of the Palestinians. Unfortunately, in our world, all those values don't play at all. It's finally about a power game. And unfortunately, the Palestinians are far too weak, and Israel is far too strong. And therefore, I don't see the international community getting into the picture, except of civil societies. That's the only international actor which has influence, has a role, and is playing the role, at least partially. Don't expect the governments, unless there will be really a pressure from their civil societies, from public opinions, you see some kind of changes in the United States, in the campuses, which are very promising. It's not enough. It's far from being enough. But maybe it will come from there. Well, a more a hopeful note, perhaps, there, Gideon. And we're, we're drawing to a close, uh, sadly. But, Diana, I'd just like to come to you. This question is coming from Robin Licker. Diana, uh, what are your thoughts on direct action taken by Palestine action? Uh, I mean, I, you have to let us know if you haven't, you don't know um, a, a lot of detail about all of this. But what are your thoughts on action being, ta being taken by Palestine action here in the UK against Elbit systems? Uh, that's included ad hacking and banner drops to offices, rooftop occupations, and and uh, other campaigning. Um, it's a similar, uh, says Robin, to the Extinction Rebellion. The tactics used uh, sufficient enough, it would seem, to engender a reaction uh, from the Israeli Minister of Strategic Affairs, who called a meeting with Benny Gantz and uh, and the British Home Secretary and Foreign Secretary, as, as well as UK police. Um, and Robin says that there, was, there has been questioning, uh, arresting, and detention of Palestine Action members and raiding of their houses. Um, well, what do you think about direct action uh, by supportive organizations overseas um, and the reaction to some of these, uh, if, if, as Robin is saying, this has been happening in this country? Well, 
without knowing all of the details, um, I think I can speak in general by, by saying that I think it's important for local um, activists to be raising awareness locally and, uh, and to be doing so to get people aware of what Israel is doing and what, it's, uh, what, it, what, it, what settler colonialism is all about and those corporations that are complicit in it. Um, I wanna look at, for example, if you look at what happened in South Africa, a lot of the, the reason that um, the, the anti-apartheid movement took off was because of local initiatives, things like people at stores refusing to check out uh, produce that was coming from South Africa to other unions that were demanding that their unions take a position on it. So I think that when it comes to the larger, more global BDS strategy, it's important to take direction from Palestine, but I also believe that getting the word out is something that is be best done locally. And while I can't speak to the specific measures that have been done, I do believe that, uh, that that's something that we have to consider. Well, thank you, Diana. We're getting a few messages in from, um, from people. Fahed Abawakel, he says, um, I wish we had in the United States a journalist who spoke truth to power like you do, Gideon. Thanks, thanks, thanks. And he also says to you, Diana, we need 50% of the Palestinian leadership to be women like you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. There you go. Roger Waters. Roger says, we the peoples of the rest of the world are holding Israel to account. It's our governments that aren't. But the scales are moving, Diana and Gideon. And all the rest of us are winning the battle. And Robin, more power to you. Thank you very much, Roger. Uh, Wally Yazbak says, Gideon, you're a beacon of truth and integrity for all of the world. Stay strong. Keep on telling the truth. Thank you, sir. Eddie O'Sullivan. Well, he asked a question, actually. I thought Eddie was going to heap praise on all of you, but you probably had enough praise heaped on all of you today, and you deserve it. And thank you very, very much. I should just say, before we go, um, that today is uh, Giving Tuesday. Um, and I should just mention this. I think you may have seen some of this. We are... Uh, asking people to think about um, helping, contributing to the Palestinian Media and Education Foundation. This is a new foundation that's been set up to train young Palestinian journalists who have very, very difficult circumstances in which to offer, very difficult to have the, the access to do the reporting, the equipment and all the rest of it that many other journalists do around the world. And uh, we would ask you, if you can, to, to support us. Um, if you believe in what we're doing, uh, please do consider donating. Uh, and I'm told here that 10 of our donors chosen at random will receive a gift of gratitude in the form of a Palestinian hand embroidered item made by the Women in Hebron Cooperative. Um, if you can follow the chat, you can see, please support us today, www.classy.org campaign giving Tuesday. So do give some thought to that because also we can get more Palestinian journalists um, onto Palestine deep dive. Gideon, you, you, want, you, you wanted to say something. One sentence, really, because you mentioned Roger Waters. I think Roger Waters can be an example for what public opinion can do, for, for what big names and grassroots can do. I mean, what a man of conscience, what a man of justice, and what a price he pays. I know he denies that he pays a price. He pays a price, and he stands up with his courage and the world listens, or at least part of the world listens to Roger Waters, not only as a Pink Floyd guitarist or, or, or bassist, but as, as a man of conscience. And more people like Roger, more courageous people who will raise their voice without any ifs and buts, just say the truth and expose the public opinions for the truth. Because if more people will know if more people will listen to Roger Waters, I think we will get closer to any kind of solution. Thank you, Gideon. Thank you very much. And in fact, your message is uh, born out here. Um, this is from uh, Wally. Wally says, uh, he says, uh, we love you, Roger Waters. Come to Atlanta, Roger. There you go. <laughs> invitation there, Roger. Um, when are you coming, Roger? So there you go. So uh, yes, well, look, thank you to both of you today. It's been a, a thoroughly, thoroughly uh, illuminating uh, discourse. We've all learned a great deal. It's fantastic to hear two very brave and informed people 
who are prepared to take a stand. And um, we thank you both very, very much. And we hope you will join us again. And we'll also hope that, um, oh, here we've got a message from uh, Robin Licker, Solidarity from Palestine Action. Uh, Gemma says, uh, thank you so much. Two very inspiring people. Um, anyway, uh, on Friday, we're going to be joined by another inspiring guest who, like Roger Waters, has taken a brave stand. Alexi Sale is a very famous British alternative comedian, uh, uh, a socialist uh, and comedian and activist. But when I say a socialist and a comedian, he is a genuinely very, very funny man, if you don't know Alexi Sale. And we're very much looking forward to having him on Friday, 4 p.m. UK time. Um, but until next time, uh, thank you again, Gideon. Thank you, Diana. All the very best to you and all the, all the very best to everybody who's been watching and listening today. Uh, thank you for your questions and see you on Friday. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Gideon. Thank, thank you. you, Diana.